Hi everyone, and welcome back to my reading of The Dishonored Wiki. As I sit in my chair, the sun is currently coming up because I've been working all night on making videos. Though I do not regret it. I've had a lot of fun. This is about Thaddeus Campbell. Thaddeus Campbell is the High Overseer of the Abbey of the Everyman in 1837 and in league with Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs in his treacher treacherous plot to usurp Jasmine Caldwin. He is the main assassination target of the mission High Overseer Campbell. Despite Campbell's high position within the restrictive Abbey of the Everyman, he is known to lead an extremely decadent and deviant lifestyle. The heart reveals he breaks each of the seven strictures daily. It's his own private joke. He maintains a secret chamber beneath the office of the High Overseer that's filled with mattresses and lingerie, plus notes discussing his dealing with a golden cat and an audiograph regarding Corvo Tana's trip from Coldridge Prison. He keeps a rune in his room as well, in a protective glass case beside a copy of Litany on the White Cliff. Rumors of Campbell's lifestyle are seemingly known to the population of Dunwall. Samuel Beechworth comments on it himself, saying, Maybe it's not my place to say, but men of the faith shouldn't live like barons. Litany, that's a good word. I don't see that used a lot. Maybe it's because I don't go to church, though. Campbell regularly resorts to blackmail to achieve his aim, keeping a journal where he records a great number of secrets about a great number of overseers. Teague Martin claims it's through blackmail he was able to ascend to the position of high overseer. When Corvo is sent to eliminate Campbell, he is tasked with retrieving Campbell's journal, which Martin can in turn use to ascend through the ranks of the Abbey. Campbell seems to be willing to kill to retain his position. A note in the secret room from Madden Prudence implies he's murdered courtesans who attempted to blackmail him. Sometime after the Empress's assassination, Corvo is approached by Callista Kernow, niece of City Watch Officer Jeff Kernow. She, she states Campbell's plotting to murder her uncle due to tensions between City Watch and Overseers, and Kernow's aversion to corruption, and asks Corvo to stop him. If Corvo takes the decanter of cider next to Campbell as he poses for Anton Sokolov's painting during Returning Home, it'll be missing in the final version. Campbell uses sword and pistol as his weapons, and is only as strong as a typical city guard, if not weaker. Kerno can occasionally kill and decapitate Campbell in a single stroke if notified right before Campbell attempts to assassinate him. This will not be counted as a kill in the mission stats or avoid the clean hands achievement. If neutralized with the heretic's brand, Campbell can be found as a weeper in the flooded district, in the room where Corvo's gear can be recovered. In the room is a, is a letter, written by Campbell shortly before he loses his mental faculties. In the letter, Corvo blames Campbell blames Corvo for the defection. Regardless of... Oops, sorry. Regardless of Corvo's detection status. The fate for Campbell is canon to Dishonored 2, according to co-creative director Harvey Smith. An overseer mentions Campbell's fates to civilians in the Canal Plaza at Campo Seda Dockyards. He says his name must be spoken and that all written records have been erased from records following his branding. As with all other assassination targets, if Corvo decides to murder Campbell with his sword, a special animation plays. In it, Campbell will attack Corvo with his sword, only for Corvo to slice Campbell's right arm at the elbow, grab him by the throat, and stab him in the neck. If Campbell's approached from behind, Corvo will swing him around, stab him in the stomach, grab his head, and then stab him in the neck. If Corvo possesses Campbell after they have drunk the poison, a unique game over screen appears saying you have been poisoned. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> All right. The heretic's brand is a dire punishment leveled on an overseer and the tool used to administer punishment. The brand is a punishment only applicable to members of the Avi, including the high overseer himself. The sentence is only given to someone who has committed a great wrong and failing to abide by the seven strictures of the Abbey of the Everyman, but has not committed a civil crime. It's a minor criminal offense to aid, bear shelter, or solace to anyone who bears the brand. An overseer being sentenced to receive the heretic's brand is a rare occurrence, indicating the significance and seriousness of the offense intended to incur it, necessary to incur it. It's not clear who, if anyone, has the authority to use the heretic's brand, and what procedures have to be followed to sentence them to receive it. It's implied when someone receives the brand, no further questions are asked, and they're immediately ostracized. If Corvo is seen breaking into the abbey and killing overseers before branding Corvo, before branding Campbell, 
the high overseer is automatically cast from the abbey. Oracular sister Romana Kaim was branded and banished from the abbey before the outsider, after the outsider appeared to her in a dream and offered her his mark. According to the book Branding Heretics, not only is the metal instrument heated, but an unnamed chemical compound is used to that acts immediately to scar those who are branded. Corvo can use the brand to eliminate Thaddeus Campbell non-lethally during the High Overseer Campbell mission. Afterwards, Campbell can be found as a weeper with his brand. Campbell mentions his intent to use the heretic's brand against undesirables, including Hiram's burrow. However, as the brand can only be used on members of the Abbey, it's unknown how he meant to accomplish this task. The brand loosely resembles the logo of the 94 game Heretic, which is pretty cool. So yeah, you basically brand this, literally brand this man as a sinner in his church, which is just, you know, it's very, very just desserts, but they all get worse. I mentioned in the first episode that they're all their own thing. Pendleton twins. Lord Morgan Pendleton is a corrupt member of Crystal's parliament and resides in Dunwall with his twin brother, Custis Pendleton. Elder brothers to Trevor Pendleton, Custon and Morgan share lordship of Pendleton Manor and control the slave mines by which the Pendleton family has made its fortune. Custis and Morgan sell their votes in Parliament to Hiram Burroughs, functioning, functioning as a loyal, lo- v- v- loyal voting block. Voyal loading block. Their voting power makes them a target of the loyalist conspiracy, for when they are limited, their parliamentary votes pass to Trevor Pendleton. They are responsible for holding Emily Caldwin prisoner at the Golden Cat bathhouse. Morgan can be found in the Golden Cat along with Custis, and is one of the main assassination targets of the Mission House of Pleasure. Morgan's renowned at the Golden Cat for his unusual requests, and the heart notes he takes cool pleasure in others' discomfort, so it's possible these requests are sadistic in nature. In conversation, Betty, a courtesan, claims the Pendletons aren't bad customers, as they're rich and mostly clean. The heart hints that Morgan and Custis were conjoined twins, saying they were born joined at the hand and a knife severed their physical bond. If Corvo spies on Morgan and his courtesan without being seen, he will witness them discussing politics. If Morgan's eliminated non-lethally, the Bottle Street gang will cut out his tongue, shave his head, and lock him in one of his own mines. If Corvo possesses a guard and approaches them in the steam room by opening the door, Morgan will say, hello, another pretty face at the party. Although Morgan Pendleton is physically encountered in the House of Pleasure mission, an image of him and his brother can be seen when Corvo first enters the void. As with all the other assassination targets, if Corvo decides to murder Morgan with his sword, a special animation plays. He grabs Morgan by the throat, and while Morgan pleads for his life, Corvo slices his throat and drops him on the ground. So yeah, in every instance, there's a a safe way to kill them. There's the sword that you can just slaughter them with. And then there's the non-lethal one. And in many cases, the non-lethal one is particularly rough. Um, Custis Pendleton's lore is very similar. The heart says that his attachment to his keen brother is not wholesome. This is for Custis now. This part is different. He says that the heart also says he's one of the keenest minds for business in all of Crystal, and he's considered to be the smartest and coolest of the Pendleton brothers. According to Wallace Higgins, on one occasion, Custis made an improper remark to Empress Jessamine Caldwin, and Corvo Atano ejected him from a state dinner before even asking who he was. Hell yeah, Corvo. Respect women. Some of the Pendleton's guards in the Golden Cat can be overheard de- discussing the p- depleted state of the Pendleton silver mines and fortunes. Custis will verify this claim in conversation with the prostitute, angrily saying that he and his brothers have had to ask for money for their cousins to get by. This is further verified in the Dishonored Game Manual, as Custis Pendleton is quoted as follows. The family silver mines haven't been quoted, haven't been producing as much, it's true. My brother Morgan and I have given... Our all, as they say, but apparently the quality of labor has greatly fallen since our father's time. The audiograph Emily Tells a Tale centers about an argument Emily witnesses between Custis, Madame Prudence, and a courtesan, which he calls the story of the fancy-dressed lady and the naked man. 
Upon turning hostile, Gustus will throw various objects, glasses, vases, and ashtrays, at Corvo if he's in a place where he can't be reached. He has a never-ending supply of these items as they materialize out of space and into his hand. Again, if he's eliminated unlethally, the Bottle Street Gang will cut his tongue out, shave his head, and lock him in one of his own mines. Where, you know, presumably he'll be worked to death. Although he is first physically encountered in the House of Pleasure mission, an image of him and his brother can be seen when Corvo enters the void. As with the other assassination targets, if Corvo kills him with his sword, special animation plays. Custis will lunge at Corvo, scratching him with his hands, while Corvo hones him by the throat. Corvo will then stab Custis at the side of his neck and drop him to the ground. And apparently... Sorry. Apparently, the game files call Curtis Custis occasionally. Or Custis Curtis, excuse me. All right. Liddy Boyle. Liddy Boyle refers to Waverly Esma and Lydia Boyle, one of the three sisters and heiress of the Boyle family, one of the most illustrious aristocrat lines in Dunwall. The Boyles are influential figures in Dunwall, holding the annual Boyle Masquerade and other lavish parties and gatherings at their ancestral home in the estate district. One of the sisters is a secret mistress and financier to the royal spymaster and lord regent, Hiram Burroughs. As such, she aided in the assassination of the Empress and the assassination, and is the assassination target during the mission Lady Boyle's last party in Dishonored. During the mission, her identity is randomized, varying in each playthrough. In Dishonored, the cor cor corroded man, the canonical continuity carries Waverly Boyle over as Burroughs' financier and mistress. A wealthy woman and the youngest of the Boyle sisters, Waverly owns Boyle Mansion, the youngest of the the lo location of the mission Lady Boyle's last party. She's more paranoid and serious than either of her sisters. If Corvo asks to take her somewhere private, she will rebuff him, saying that he does she doesn't know him or his family. She will respond readily with a claim her life's in danger, which validates her previously held fears, and complies with his, his instructions afterward. She suffers from reckless frivolity, followed by long bouts of melancholy. In his memoirs, Trevor Pendleton refers to her as a traitorous little weasel. According to two guests at her party, it's common knowledge among the aristo aristocracy that Waverly likes to dress in red. Now a matter of public record, Waverly Boyle was kidnapped by the obsessive Laura Brisby at the Masquerade of 1837. From there, she was unable. She was unable. From there, she was taken to Brisby's old family estate on a reclusive island, unable to return to Tunwall due to being marked as a criminal. Brisby disappeared a few later. A rumor speculating Waverly had arranged for his disappearance, though no one could find any evidence. She's alive by 1851, supposedly doing quite well for herself with it. Brisby's family fortune. I didn't know that. That's not bad. Esma, the promiscuous sister. Esma's sexual activities and untidy habits frequently put her at odds with her sister. Waverly regards her with a, as a drunkard, while the heart notes she drinks to forget herself. Further investigation using the heart reveals Esma once gave birth to a daughter, a process is excruciating for her. It's unknown if the child survived or not, but the experience left Esma unable to become pregnant again. Kidnapping of her sister Waverly in 37 sank her into depression. The event drove her to argue with her remaining sister Lydia, which drove them both into isolation within their state for years. Esma finally recovered and took her family's mantle, finding her life purpose in the annual Boyle Masquerade. She attempted to cure her sister's dementia by having her consult the royal physician Anton Sokolov. When he finally declared her incurable, Esma had her, secret, her sister secretly locked somewhere in the Boyle mansion, tended to by discreet servants, and her death officially pronounced. In 51, she continues to, continues to hold the traditional party each year. During the 51 Masquerade Ball, she agreed to the Royal Protector and Spymaster Corvo to honor participation to the activity's security detail. When the Whalers assault, assaulted the party and took the upper hand, she remained calm enough to put on an act and distract her captors for Corvo to strike back. She lost all composure when the gang's leader Zukov brought her sister with him, revealing her terrible fate to the party attendees. Lydia's murder and Zukov's orders were the last stroke she needed to withdraw from her family affairs, leaving her place to her nephew Ichabod Boyle. The mysterious and musical Lydia bemoans her ability to find a true musician in Dunwall to take as a lover. If Corvo, if Corvo convinces her to go somewhere private, she will take him to the music room. 
The hard notes that she is one of the greatest musicians in all of Crystal, a skill she's cultivated in the absence of sociability or great beauty. Like her sister Emma, she was deeply affected by the kidnapping of her sister Waverly in 37. It drove her to argue, and her sadness and anger was being unbearable. Unlike, unlike Esma, she never recovered and was officially declared moonstruck. At some point, she was dragged away in a straitjacket and spent months of isolation in a padded cell, being tended to by the royal physician Anton Sokolov. When he declared her incurable, that he was brought back to the Boyle Mansion to be secluded and closed off wing the Boyle Mansion and tended to by discreet servants. Esma pronounced her death to hide her illness from the public eye, and Lydia spent her remaining years away from any human contact. Her, gr- her anger grew even more as she was forced to only listen to the annual Boyle Masquerade. By 51, no one had seen her in years, not even her sister Emma. During the 51 ball, Zukov, leader of the Whalers, visited her in isolation so she could reveal to him the location of a hidden vault under the mansion, promising to save her. Uh, Zukov won his field to revealing, as far t- as revealing Lydia to the partygoers, to the horror of Esma. Eventually, she is killed by Galia Fleet for her bones, at Zukov's command. Anton Sokolov, noted weirdo, claims Lady Boyle has the finest har- hindquarters in all of Dunwall. I think it's Corvo, but, you know, Anton can be wrong. If Corvo eavesdrop on Curtis Pendleton's conversation with Violetta in The Golden Cat, the courtesan will suggest she dress up as Lady Boyle for the evening. Curtis, in turn, expresses anger towards Lady Boyle, particularly for the discovery of valuable crystals on her land. After some thought, he agrees to the courtesan idea, saying he would like to teach Lady Boyle a lesson. Ugh. As with all other assassination targets, if Corvo decides to murder her with the sword, special animation. In it, he will embrace her, then stab her in the stomach and gently place her corpse on the ground. If she's approached from behind, he will stab her in the shoulder, and then as she falls to the ground, he will stab her again in the neck. Ooh. The developers admitted via Twitter that they had probably been wrong-headed about the idea to give Lady Boyle to her stalker, and said that she probably wrapped that a pathetic, adoring tweet creep around her finger. Yeah, that was always the rawest one, because, like, being forced to be a slave until death is pretty raw. Um, Just being, like, given freely to your stalker is pretty raw. Just that you get stuffed in your stalker's basement is... A little extreme. Um, that said, I don't think that they were wrong to do it. I think that it's interesting for Corvo to be like, well, I didn't kill anyone. You know. Commenced a couple lives of slavery, but, you know, didn't kill him. I like that because normally, you know, it's very, very black and white when you kill or not kill in games, you know? Like, Infamous's system of, you know, good versus evil is extremely stark, as is, uh, to a lesser extent, Deus Ex. So I think it's very interesting. And the Arcane offices in Austin, Texas have a replica of her mask. But yeah, I think that that's one of the raw ones. Farley Havelock is a former ally of Corvo Otano. Once an admiral in the Crystal Navy, he was discharged for refusing to sail under the command of the Lord Regent, Hiram Burroughs. In partnership with Trevor Pendleton and Teague Martin, he created the Loyalist Conspiracy with the aim of reinstating the rightful heir to the Empire, Emily Caldwin, to the throne. After his plans come to fruition, Havelock takes the mantle of Lord Regent and portrays Corvo, thereby becoming the main antagonist for the last third of Dishonored. This is a big old spoiler, by the way. Naturally. Sometime after the Empress was assassinated and her daughter kidnapped, Havelock organized the Loyalist Conspiracy. Since he had become the owner of the Hound Pits pub several years prior to the outbreak of the Rat Plague, he utilizes the drinking establishment as a Loyalist base of operations. In his position as leader of the conspiracy, Havelock arranges Corvo Tano's escape from Coldridge Prison with the help of Teak Martin, and tasks Corvo with completing various missions to achieve the conspiracy's ultimate goal of overthrowing the Lord Regent and rescuing Emily. Throughout the course of Dishonored, Havelock updates the law in his room at the Hound Pits, detailing his thoughts and feelings. In it, he praises Corvo for completing feats he had not thought possible, for instance, noting he had given Corvo one odds in five odds of one in five for escaping Coldridge while simultaneously expressing concern over Corvo's skill and what 
threat he might pose to their future efforts. After the fall of Hiram Burroughs, Havelock Martin and Pendleton betray Corpo, poisoning him and leaving him for dead. The three conspirators kill many of the other loyalists who cover up their connection to Corvo's actions and set the city watch in the hound pits, reporting to have discovered the conspiracy's base of operations. They then take power by presenting the rescued Emily and ruling in her name, with Havelock himself becoming the new Lord Regent. Additionally, Havelock appoints himself Grand Animal of the Fleet and Supreme Commander of the Combined Armies of the Empire. Havelock then retreats to King Sparrow Island, along with Pendleton and Martin, taking Emily with him. Low chaos. Havelock can be found in a penthouse of the Burroughs Lighthouse on Kingsborough Island. Pendleton and Martin are dead at a table, apparently poisoned. Havelock is found muttering to himself about the failure of his plans and Corvo's imminent revenge, having succumbed to feelings of guilt and extreme paranoia. You can choose to interact with Havelock to get the key to Emily's room. If confronted non-violently, Corvo will not attack Cor- Havelock will not attack Corvo, but instead face a nearby fireplace and speak briefly before offering the key. If Corvo takes the key, Havelock will attack him. It's possible for Corvo to take the key without Havelock noticing. In High Chaos, Havelock is found holding Emily hostage on the level above the penthouse, at the edge of an unguarded lockway above a fatal drop. If Corvo doesn't act or he moves too close to Havelock, the Admiral will jump the walkway to his death, taking Emily with him. If Corvo manages to approach Havelock before he can jump, blink and bend time being popular methods, he can save Emily, and Havelock will fall to his death alone. If Corvo kills Havelock with a ranged attack or power, Havelock will fall, but Emily will grab the edge of the platform. Corvo can then pull her up, but if he takes too long, Emily will fall to her death. It's also possible to deal with Havelock non lethal in the High Chaos ending. This can be achieved by various means, including possessing him and shooting him out. He's voiced by John Slattery, and he once had a younger brother, an avid painter who died at the age of nine, who Havelock loved. In response to Havelock... Or in response to Pendleton's melancholy over the death of his brothers, because remember, the third Pendleton is with a conspiracy, Havelock briefly ponders the if he could kill his own brother, were he still alive. He concludes that he could, if it were necessary to the cause. Harvey Smith reveals that Havelock may have had a domineering father also in the Navy. At one point, during the stay at the Hound Pits pub, Havelock adds a diary entry speculating on whether Corvo is Emily's father. By the way, that's one of my favorite, like, not exactly twists... Because, like, everyone knew it, you know? It's very, very obvious that Corvo is the father of Emily. But in the game, it's never, like, outright said. And then in the second game, it is. And in the first game, it's just like, hey, I'm just doing my job. And that's cooler than, like, I've got to rescue my daughter, you know? Because rescuing your daughter is a very generic, you know, hero motivation. But in the second game you and your daughter both being playable and being like badasses is also really cool. Side note, I'm just going to bitch about Watch Dogs for a second here. In Watch Dogs 1, the whole plot is Aiden Pierce trying to get revenge or rescue his uh, niece and or nephew, right? The reason that they did that is so they, is it's rather transparent. The reason they did that is so they wouldn't have to write a wife character into the game. <laughs> Uh, and so they could make Aiden Pierce feel younger because old people have kids, you know? It just, oh, it's, it's so dumb. Watch Dogs 1 is really kind of dumb. They tried, and Watch Dogs 2 is cooler. But the first one is Okay. So, Ugh. Havelock can be seen briefly in the opening of Dishonored 2. Samuel Beechworth states that he once served in the Navy under Havelock, though he doubts he remembers. In a line accessible after the High Overseer Campbell mission, Havelock states that Samuel looks familiar, though he can't recall why. The heart states Havelock has killed men and whales for money and pleasure, and describes him as having the bloodlust. The official story is that Havelock was discharged from the Navy after refusing to sail under Hiram Burroughs. The heart added, sorry, the heart added, adds that he tried to seize control of the military after the Empress was murdered. Cecilia, who tells Corvo about Havelock's past, admits her understanding of the story is not clear. After being discharged, Havelock thought of becoming a pirate until he decided to create the Loyalist Conspiracy. 
As with all yada yada. A special animation plays. In it, Corvo stabs Havelock's forearm when the Admiral pulls out his pistol, turns Havelock's arm towards his head, and forces him to pull the trigger. That's extreme. Admiral Havelock has an unusually powerful blade lock, greater even than Dowd. Beating him with a blade lock is very difficult, even with the sword crossing update, upgrade, and the fencer bone charm equipped. He has more health than normal, and unlocked City Watch, and like City Watch officers, is skilled at blocking, dodging, and kicking, but otherwise has no extraordinary abilities. He uses the same lines as officers to, uh, while searching for Corvo after being alert, alerted. In The Purist and the Price, one of the Dishonored comics, it's revealed Corvo canonically killed Havelock by slitting his throat from behind. There was another loyalist in development, a businessman named John. During development, John's character was combined with Havelock's. That makes sense. All right, we've only got a few assassination targets left. We just have Hiram Burroughs and... I could talk about the miscellaneous extra characters or other people like the gangs, but I just want to talk about the assassination targets. Hiram Burroughs, known officially as the Lord Regent, is mastermind of the coup against Jes uh, Empress Jessamine Caldwin, along with Thaddeus Campbell. To cover his tracks, Burroughs blames his death on her, her death on his, her bodyguard, Corvo, who is imprisoned. He's the main antagonist for the first two-thirds of Dishonored. His oppressive and corrupt rule against the people of Dunwall leads to dissatisfaction and rebellion. The dissatisfaction becomes more pronounced as Corvo eliminates Burroughs' allies, cutting off his funding and crippling his ability to pay the city watch. Burroughs blames the city's problems on the Empress and the laziness and disorder of the common folk. Corvo is tasked with assassinating him during the mission Return to the Tower. Before taking on Lord Regent, he was the royal spymaster. As such, he works with great impunity and little oversight, staging campaigns of espionage against the gangs of Dunwall, and making plans outside even the Empress's no sh knowledge. The heart reveals Burroughs suffers from a compulsive need to have everything in order, a characteristic also shown in his field notes. Several, several years prior to the events of Dishonored, he began an internal investigation to route traitors in the government, which put him at odds with the Empress. He claims that her very nature as a trusting person blighted her to the work of traitors that must move among them. Burroughs is distressed by what he perceives to be a lack of concern on the Empress's part for security and order, saying she would rather spend her time with the royal protector. Damn right. She also disapproves of how she parents Emily Caldwin, saying the child is undisciplined and, uns and spoiled, and every moment spent at play is a moment wasted. An audiograph stolen from his safe reveals that the rat plague was caused by Burroughs himself. He and his red do retinue introduced rats from the Pendicean continent into the poorest quarters of Dunwall to eradicate poverty by limiting the poor. The plague quickly spiraled out of control. Burroughs feared that his scheming would be discovered by the Empress, who ordered him to investigate the matter for evidence of foul play. He commissioned the assassin Dow to eliminate her and arranges for Corva to be executed at the crime. Thereafter, he takes charge of the Empire as Lord Regent to steer towards what he envisions as Gristle's grand signing future. Lady Boyle is his mistress of several years. She's also his financier, though whether or not this preceded his rise to regency is unknown. He's fond of her, spending his limited off time in her company, and is distressed by her eventual fate. One by one, Corvo takes out members of Burroughs' conspiracy, crippling his government along the way. Eventually, Corvo is tasked with the elimination of Burroughs himself. Corvo can either kill him or expose him by stealing an incriminating audiograph and playing it over the city's propaganda system, having him arrested for high treason and ending his reign. He was uh, canonically arrested by Corvo, who carried out his lawful execution. Correspondence between Burroughs and Dowd suggests that had Corvo not returned to Dunwall Tower early and returned to the Empress's murder, Burroughs would have used Corvo for his own ends. He knows that Corvo would have been useful to me, although he's satisfied with Dowd's improvisation. Corvo's unique assassination animation is Corvo stabs Burroughs in the shoulder, then turns around to the other side while the sword is still in his body. Corvo then grabs hold of Burroughs' head and breaks his neck, retrieving the blade before the Lord Regent falls. If Corvo reveals his identity, Burroughs becomes one of the few individuals outside the conspiracy to know the identity of the masked felon. 
Bros is capable of noticing if a safe has been opened and will react. During his reign, he wrote a letter each day, seemingly posted on notice boards around Dunwall. Many can be found many can be found as rubbish around the city. If Corbo possesses Burroughs while he's being arrested, the guards will attack him. If Corbo possesses one of the guards arresting Burroughs, he will flee. And then Dowd. Dowd, aka the Knife of Dunwall, is the leader and probable founder of a group of assassins known as the Whalers that operated in Dunwall during the Rat Plague. He's responsible for the death of the Empress Jessamine Caldwin and the kidnapping of her daughter, Emily. He's a major adversary and target in Dishonored and the protagonist of the DLC, Knife of Dunwall and the Brigmore Witches. He returns as the protagonist in the novel Dishonored Return of Dowd and an ally to Billy Lurk in Dishonored Death of the Outsider. Dowd's mother was rumored to have originated on an island off the Vendician continent. He was conceived on the 13th of the month of ice, 1795, on a pirate vessel which held her captive. She was rumored to be a witch marked by the outsider and took control of said ship during its return to Sarconos. Dowd noted that she was simply proficient in the use of poisons and hallucinogens and ruthless in their administration. Dowd was born in Sarconos and grew up in various cities of the Isle. At some point in his early childhood, his natural abilities caught the attention of his mysterious actor, which led to an abduction. At the age of 16, Dowd moved to Dunwall, where he began to make a name for himself, moving in among the shopkeepers and watch officers of Dunwall like a reaper through wheat. Dowd traveled through the Isles seeking the outsider shrine, and was rumored to have spent a winter at the Academy of Natural Philosophy, of which he made cryptic remarks a few times to his followers. He eventually attracted the attention of the outsider, who marked him in 1820. Now branded, Dowd became infamous as an assassin for hire, feared not only for his skill, but for his magic powers. His known powers are Blink, Bend Time, Summon Assassin, Void Gaze, Pull, and a resistance to poisons and sedatives. Another power, Arcane Bond, grants him the ability to grant lesser versions of his magic to others, which he uses, utilizes to empower his followers. Dowd used these powers to establish himself as an assassin for hire for the elite of Dunwall. He began to gra gather other marginals of Dunwall and establish his own gang of mercenaries and assassins, the Whalers, with which he shared his powers. In 1829, he crossed paths with Billy Lurk, a street urchin with an affinity for the trade, a, who a year prior murdered Rodanus Ebo, the Duke of Circonos. He trained her personally, and with her quick learning skills, with her quick learning and skills, and her quick learning and skills would eventually earn her place as his second in command. During the plague, Dowd moved his base from the to the Rudshore Chamber of Commerce in the devastating quarantine flooded district. In 1835, he met some of the witches from the newly formed Brigmore Coven. The Whalers' reputation in the underworld of Dunwall caught the attention of Hiram Burroughs, who made use of their services a number of times in his capacity as a royal spymaster. During the Rat Plague, Burroughs hired Dowd and his assassins to murder the Empress and kidnap her daughter. Despite the Outsider's initial favor for Dowd, a rift developed in the two after this event. The Outsider himself notes that he lost interest in Dowd prior to the assassination of the Empress and acts, interacts with Dowd in a hostile and derisive manner throughout the Knife of Dunwall. Conforming to Burroughs' plan, Dowd takes up a position on Dunwall Tower with Billy Lurk and a group of assassins on the 18th day of the month of Earth, 37. They are to take advantage of a moment when the Empress and her daughter are alone in the palace gazebo, while the royal protector Corvo was away on official business. Neither the spymaster nor Dowd anticipated that Corvo would return that day from his trip around the Isles. Seeing his men in difficulty... Facing the royal protector, Dowd himself intervenes and executes the contract, leaving Corvo as the only surviving witness. In the months that followed, the royal spymaster implicated Corvo as culprit to hide his own participation and Dowd's. Dowd delivered Emily to the Pendleton twins, Morgan and Custis, allies of Burroughs. He later threatened the spymaster for a higher price because of Corvo's intervention, which Burroughs paid and assured he would offer other assignments. Unbeknownst to Dowd, Burroughs then appointed Lord Regent and aided by High Overseer Campbell, would orchestrate a six months later sweep of the flooded district by warfare overseers to eradicate him and the Whalers. After carrying out the assassination and delivering Emily to the Burroughs agent, Dowd is racked with fear of the act, a feeling the outsider reinforces. Appearing to Dowd after the assassination, 
The outsider provides him with one last gift, so he may alter coming events. The name Delilah. Unable to abide a mystery by his own admittance, Dad begins to investigate the snake bit and send the name. The conclusion of the DLC is affected by the chaos Dad inflicts over the course of his search. Some of how Corva's actions affect the conclusion of Dishonored. With the help of Billy Lur, Dad discovers the wailing troller Delilah at the Wathwild Slaughterhouse. His subsequent haunt eventually directs him to Delilah Copperspoon, a painter, black magic practitioner, and leader of the Brigmore Witches. As Dowd discovers Delilah took an interest in him long before he ever heard of her, learning, for instance, that Arnold and Talia Timsch saw Delilah painting his name across the canvas during a seance, the assassin's hideout in the flooded district is overtaken by overseers. After pushing back the overseers, Dowd learns he was betrayed by Billy, who saw his regret over the Empress's assassination and plotted to take his place. Working with Delilah, they brought the overseers to the flooded district and arranged for Billy to kill Dowd herself. In high chaos, Billy duels Dowd for the leadership of the Whalers, and Dowd can neither kill or spare her. In low chaos, she chooses not to go through with it, leaving her fate in Dowd's hands. Dowd's decision in either case affects the outsider's final opinion, and the story closes. Following Billy's betrayal, which affected him deeply, and the removal of the overseers, Dowd discovers Delilah's location at the Brigmore Manor, outside the quarantine zone. He enlists the aid of the Dead Eels gang leader, Lily S Lizzie Stride, to help him reach the hideout, accomplishing various tasks in Cold Ridge and Draper's Ward to secure his passage. He also encounters the Coven on several occasions and uncovers clues to Delilah's ultimate plan. When he arrives at the manor, Dowd realizes that Delilah is planning to use a powerful ritual to steal Emily Caldwin's body and rule in her place as Empress. In response, he pursues Delilah to the Void and eliminates her in the midst of a ritual, protecting the child he once abducted. While Dishonored runs currently with the events of Knife of Dunwall and Brigmore Witches, the mission Flooded District falls between Dodd's elimination of Delilah and the DLC's epilogue. Discovering a poisoned Corvo adrift in the flowing district, Dowd confiscates his gear and orders his men to place Corvo in confinement awaiting delivery to Farley Havelock in exchange for a large bounty. Corvo escapes soon after, and one of Dowd's men assumes uh, appears to inform him of the breakout. Dowd surmises that Corvo is bound for the Commerce Building to confront him, and waits for the man's arrival, recording an audiograph castigating Hiram Burroughs and lamenting his own part in the murder of the Empress. Dowd's reaction to Corvo's arrival based, varies based on Corvo's chaos. In low chaos, Dowd uses Ben time on his men and orders them not to interview while he and Corvo duel. In high chaos, Dowd makes allows his men to assist him in battle to take down Corvo at any cost. Dowd is ultimately defeated and makes a plea for his life. Dowd muses on events that transpired during his pursuit of Delilah, noting that choices always matter to someone somewhere, and people must live the consequences of their decision. The conclusion leads him to surrender at the mercy of Corvo, who acts in accordance with Dowd's chaos, the end of the Brickmore which is either killing or sparing him. If Dowd is spared, he can be seen placing the sword of the Tomb of the Empress at the credits. If he's killed, his body is cremated on a boat in the flooded yard in the Graves Refinery. If Dowd spared Billy at the end of the Knife at Dunwall, she'll be there as well, looking at a distance. In the canon of the sequels to Dishonored, Corvo spared Dowd's life. It's revealed in Dishonored the Corroded Man that many people tried locating Dowd after the events of the Wigmore Witches, but without success. Dowd returns to Dunwall fifteen years later, having nightmares about his past after going several years without living after going several years without them living in Tivia and well gone. Jean to seek out a way of killing the outsider, where he learns about the twin bladed knife through rumors and that it was spotted in Dunwall. He arrives the day of Delilah Koo and spots the Empress fleeing from her tower, but doesn't intervene. He instead goes to Wormwood District to get in contact with the leader of the Six Days gang who handle the smuggling of such items. One of the clockwork soldiers arrives while he's in mid-fight and destroys it. He destroys it, but when reinforcements arrive, he and the leader, Jack, flee from Dunwall, unaware he's being spotted by the Devlin couple. He's later smuggled to, Por smuggled to Porterfell, a small village in Gristol, to meet with the current order of the Twin-Bladed Knife, a collector known as Maximilian Norcris. In the process, he's attacked by three agents of the League of Protectors. One is killed in the struggle, one escapes, and the other is captured, taken along with Dahl to Mortengard Castle. Death of the Outsider. Dad ends up in Karnaka in his quest to kill the Outsider. Sometime before the start of the game, Dad was captured by the Eyeless Cult and forced to fight for months in the pit of a fight club owned by them. 
Aided by his former second in command, Billy Lurk, is, he plans to confront underground fight clubs, sisters of the Oracular Order, and the Eyeless Cult to gather the artifacts that will help them take down the Void Deity. Dad admits that he needs Billy's help to complete the mission, and says he'll never recover from the damage he took in the pits, which proves accurate. Throughout the game, Dad remains on the dreadful whale, comments, coughing and saying he can feel the Void dragging him away, and is limited to giving information on the world to Billy, and giving advice on missions. After learning the weapon required to kill the outsiders in the Dolores McCall's deposit and loan bank, he sends Billy to retrieve it. During the mission, Dowd passes away on the dreadful whale from natural causes, which the outsider alludes from natural call- causes, which the outsider alludes to Billy. After returning to find him dead, Billy burns a ship, which acts as a funeral pyre for Dodd. After his funeral, Billy played a recording Dowd left for her, saying his goodbye and making his peace with who she had been and his f- history with his former apprentice. Later, Dowd's spirit is encountered in the void just before Billy's about to kill the outsider. His form is wavy and indistinct, and at first he doesn't recognize her. He encourages her to finish the outsider. Here she's given a choice. If Billy kills the outsider, Dowd will speak with her saying it's done, but Billy declares herself to be always a killer and that she'll never change. In the setting, Dowd does not find peace, and his spirit is doomed to wander the void for eternity. If the Billy decides not to kill him, she convinces Dowd to let him live by revealing the circumstances of his mortal life, and reminding Dodd of how he spared her once. Dodd frees the outsider by speaking his name. Dodd agrees. After freeing the outsider, he says a final farewell and finds peace as his soul dissipates. One of the more callous and calculated individuals in the Isles, Dodd has no qualms killing for coin and does so indiscriminately. Dodd is known to never smile or laugh, further showing how cold he is. From aristocratic pedophiles to respectable law enforcement and scholars, all are potential victims. Realizing the fortune of the supernatural abilities, he uses them to primarily force his will on the world. The whispers of the outsider firm only further inflate his ego, causing him to believe he's special or important. For years, Dowd continues his crimson lit trail of bloodshed, undeterred by the results of the wet work. It's only when he kills Jessamine and abducts her daughter that finally breaks something breaks within him. Rather than su- successfully repressing the regretfulness brought about by the deed, he instead becomes filled with grief and dismayed with the societal collapse of Dunwall. Dowd realizes his story is coming to a conclusion of his making, and comes to terms with the consequences of his life choices. After realizing Delilah was trying to take over Emily's mind and body, something changed in Dowd when his second command Billy Lurk saw. She eventually saw him as weak from his regrets and betrayed him and fought him and lost. Despite the betrayal of his most trusted assassin, Dowd spared Lurk, which shows he's capable of mercy. Continuing on the quest, Dowd investigates Delilah and realizes that by taking over en- Emily, she'd rule the Empire as a tyrant and wreak havoc across the world. Dowd goes out of his way and puts his own life at risk from the Brigmore witches to stop the little girl he'd once save the little girl he'd once abducted. Which means that he is willing to put his life on the line to ensure the Empress's- Empire's safety. He's willing to turn Corvo in for the monetary reward it'll yield him. Despite regrets that he still had a cold demeanor, he holds on to in the fight with Corvo. After losing to Corvo, Dowd snaps out of his callous behavior and asks Corvo for mercy, as after murdering the Empress, something broke in him. He tells, the Corvo, he tells Corvo the outsider made him feel like he was powerful, but says that he has accomplished no more than Corvo. He promises Corvo he's done with killing, and said he wants to go away from Dunwall. Corvo on the edge of killing decides his parent, as Jezamine will not want him to kill a defenseless person, and decides that letting Dowd live is better than death. After this, Dowd lays his sword he dropped in the fight on the Empress's grave, revealing he feels heavy remorse from killing her and wishes to pay his respects. He enjoys a long retirement in Karnaka from his gang and killing for almost 16 years. He's voiced by Michael Madsen, playing the character he played in Kill Bill. It was revealed by Harvey Smith in an AMA that Dowd is still alive at the time of Dishonored 2, but not doing well. This was hidden at game. In a mission, Death to the Empress, a letter between Megan Foster and a former whaler reveals that no one from the former gang has been able to locate him. If Megan, who's revealed to be Billy Lurk in the last mission, survives at the end of the game, the outsider tells in the epilogue that she left a secret the closest thing she'd ever known to family. Delilah expresses she feels and knows that Dowd is alive somewhere while taking while talking idly in the last mission while painting. Her spirit trapped in the heart remarks 
There are still there are marks on her flesh made by the knife of Dunwall. Cursed doubt who hides in the world and breathes still. The heart mentioned to Emily that six came over the walls and dragged Emily from her mother's corpse. Two are still alive. Both Dodd and Billy took part in Jessamine's assassination. Upon receiving the heart for the first time in the void, using it will receive multiple unique lines, one of which confirms Dowd to be alive. The one who took my life walks the world still, but he's withdrawn. According to the official guidebook, Ego Hominiae Lupus, I am a wolf to man, is his motto. How pretentious. The unique animation is... Uh, Corvo grabs Dowd, slits his throat, and throws him to the right as he dies. In the Brigmore Witches, Corvo throws Dodd frontally over the wall, rather into the hole to the right. Dodd is either immune or resistant to Corvo's magic powers and gadgets. If Corvo progresses him, if Corvo attempts to possess him, Cor uh, Dodd will say that his mind is the last place Corvo would want to be. Wanted posters for Dodd feature a picture of a regular assassin rather than Dodd. But throughout the Knife of Dunwall, various civilians recognize him instantly. Jerome in the Brigmore Witches notes that he can recognize Dome that from it do yeah, recognize Dowd from his wanting posters. Dowd doesn't have a mask, he can still zoom in and out as though he had a spyglass. He's called the Big Knife and the Old Knife in a letter between Megan Foster and a former whaler in Dishonored 2. He if Dowd initiates dialogue after sneaking up on Delilah, she derisively calls him the Mouse of Dunwall. In the German, Russian, and Italian translations of the Brigmore Witches, Dowd said he moved from Sirkonos to Dunwall at the age of 16. Harvey Smith confirmed the information. Dowd's plea to Corvo varies between Dishonored and the Brigmore Witches, with the former being longer. Though he can use a pistol in the game, in the game he never requires upgrades for the weapon. According to Harvey Smith, he was conceived on a pirate vessel and grew up in various Arconian cities. He can't be dismembered. He can't be drop assassinated if fully alerted to Corvo's presence and if Corvo is in sight. Rather, he'll block it. If killed from behind... Sorry. If killed from behind, Dow does not stab in the stomach and neck from other, like other assassination targets. He is simply killed in the same way as any regular enemy. It's stated by Galliot Fleet that Dow occasionally made cryptic mentions of the Academy of Natural Philosophy. Further implying the rumors about him spending a winter at the Academy further implying that the rumors about him spending a winter at the Academy are real. Upon seeing an example of Trimble's handwriting, Dowd comments on how he distrusts people who can write that neatly. As a result of his use of a corrupted bone charm, bone charms, bone charms, Dowd is missing at least three teeth. Zokolov's painting of Dowd shows his code being blue rather than red. This is in line with the Master Assassins, who wear blue outfits. It's stated in the book that Dowd has no interest in sex, implying he's asexual. The accuracy of the book is questionable and the author unknown. Harvey Smith confirmed through Twitter that Dowd is ace. Despite placing a sword at the Empress's grave in the epilogue, in The Return of Dowd, he receives... The same sword from Makash Shinnan Wall in the cliff face on Shinnan Dairy Peak in Karnaka. According to the book, he hadn't thought he would ever wield it again, yet something compelled him years ago to, th to keep it rather than throw it in the sea. Upon meeting his spirit in the void at the end of Death of the Outsider, he can be heard reminiscing about his late mother. He reveals he tried to find the void, but he can't remember her face. She had too many veins that her son didn't know the true one. He blames the Outsider for losing everything he had, including his mother. And then there's some more lore, some more paintings. Man. Hell yeah. All right. That's a, uh... oh, I didn't read the monsters. Well, maybe I'll do a fourth one, but for now that should be enough. I had a lot of fun reading the Dishonored Wiki. I'd rather enjoy this game and its world building. Although I think it can be a little over the top at times. That said, it's very fun. Um, if you'd like to hear more, let me know. You know, comments are there for a reason. But I digress. Thank you for coming. I've been Alfred. Stay curious about the life and the world.
remain at peace.